we have a very special food tank uh, members meeting. Again, thank you all for being food tank members. It, it really means the world to us. I will introduce our guest, Dr. Mark Hyman, in just a minute. But first, let me just give you an overview of what we're going to be doing for the next, uh, uh, you know, 55 minutes or so. Our meeting will start with a conversation between Dr. Hyman and myself, and then we will open it up to Q&A with the audience. And so during this first portion, I just ask that you all remain on mute because we are using parts of this discussion for this week's episode of our podcast, Food Talk with Danny Nirenberg. And I'd like to acknowledge that our great executive producer, Rob Perra, is also uh, on today's meeting. So if you don't already subscribe to our podcast, please make sure that you find us on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you already listen um, uh, to hear conversations with other incredible food system leaders like Mark. And also please sign up for his podcast, The Doctor's Pharmacy, which is really wonderful. He let me be on it once and it was a, really a highlight uh, of, of my career. So I thank Mark for that. Um, once we uh, open our Q&A, please use the raise your hand button in Zoom and then um, I will call on you and Elena and Bernie will help me if I'm sort of scrolling through and can't see you. Um, and then you can take yourself off mute and ask Mark your question. So um, uh, please, if you can help me right now, please just take a second to rename yourself in Zoom with your first and last name if you haven't already so that it's easy for me to call on you. I'm very needy today, I'm sorry, everyone. Um, I also wanna let folks know that this is the, you know, today's conversation is part of an ongoing series of a really exclusive interactive conversations with leading thinkers in, in food and agriculture. And, you know, I think you, um, a lot of you remember in December that we had Chloe Sorvino uh, from Forbes and the author of Raw Deal talk about her book. We hosted, you know, the amazing uh, chef Alice Waters uh, from Chez Panisse. Um, uh, last month, um, our next meeting will feature farmer, author, advocate, and, and food uh, shiro and heroine Leah Peniman of Soul Fire Farm, who is coming out with a new book, uh, Black Earth Wisdom. So you will not want to miss that conversation for sure. And so one final update, um, Elena will post a link in the chat so you can see the agenda for food tanks upcoming summit in collaboration with South by Southwest, Houston Tillotson University, and Driscoll's in Austin on Sunday, March 12th. If any of you as food team members can attend, we are able to offer complimentary uh, tickets, um, which also includes a special evening reception with celebrity chef and food tank friend, Andrew Zimmern. Um, so to make sure you, that you're added to the guest list, uh, please email Elena at foodtank.com and she will go ahead and put um, her email in the chat. So now I am super, super excited to um, turn our, our conversation, to, to turn the conversation uh, with with um, Mark Hyman. He's somebody I greatly admire because he's so, he's so passionate about his work. He's so passionate about helping people regain their health, helping them keep their health. And, and most importantly to me, he, he believes in the power of food for better human health, of course, but also the health of the planet. Uh, Mark is a, a practicing family physician. He's the founder and director of the Ultra Wellness Center, the founder and senior advisor for the Cleveland Clinic Center for Functional Medicine. He's a four-time New York Times bestselling author, which is incredible, and a board president for clinical affairs for the Institute for Functional Medicine. He is also the founder and chair of the Food Fix Campaign, which is dedicated to transforming our food and agriculture systems through policy. Um, and as I said, he hosts the podcast, The Doctor's Pharmacy, and is a regular medical contributor to television shows on CBS, um, like CBS This Morning, Today, Good Morning America, The View, and CNN. Um, and his latest book, I'm going to show it again, just came out yesterday on February 21st. It is entitled Young Forever, The Secrets to Living Your Longest, Healthiest Life. And I'm really, really excited to discuss it with him today. So Elena will also share a link to purchase uh, Mark's new book in the chat. And we encourage you all to get a copy um, because um, one, of the, one of the people who wrote a blurb said something that really struck me. They said, it's an impressive guidebook. It really is. It's a guidebook to better health, better aging, of course. But I think you know people of all ages can learn from this. So Mark, thank you for being here. How are you? You're on mute, sir. 
You can't get yourself off. Alina, can you help? Hold on one second. <laughs> I'm there good you now. are. There I'm good now. How, how's everybody? Good to see everybody. Hello. Hi. Great group of folks, Mark. So thank you for being here. Um, I'm excited about Young Forever. I have a, I have a birthday next week. So so oh, I'm excited. I won't, I won't be, I won't be rude. I won't be rude and ask you what that is. <laughs> 29, Mark, always 29. 29. Um, okay. <laughs> so the last, <laughs> um, the last time I saw you, um, I let you cut in front of me at the, the White House Conference on Hunger, Health that's and right, Nutrition. That's it was right. really We're nice to see thing. you there. Yeah. <laughs> um, that's true. Thank and you, you know, <laughs> your voice, I think, is so and I, we can get into this later, but I think your voice is so instrumental in not just, you know, health, but also the power of policy. So we can talk mm -hmm. about that in a little bit. But my, my first question to you is, why write this book now? Why was it so important for you to write this book at this particular moment? Sort of, you know, we're coming out of the pandemic, all these other things are happening. Yeah, great question. I think, I think for me, um, you know, it, it's, it's such an important time to think about reimagining our approach to health and disease because the pandemic highlighted the fact that we are a sick population. The reason we're 4% of right. the world's population and had 16% of the COVID cases and deaths, four times what we should have had, even though we spent twice as much money as any other developed nation on healthcare, is because we're all so sick and overweight and pre-inflamed. And, and the book Young Forever really is about the science of creating health. It's what we know now about how our bodies work as a system and how to work with that system to create health wherever you are in your life. And I think the, the, the exciting part also is this rapid growth of research in longevity science, which really didn't exist 10, 15 years ago. It was just a, in the yeah. backwaters of nutrition science and research. People didn't think you should even research it because we're all going to get older and nothing you can do about it. And so why bother? Mm. But the truth is we actually can do a lot about it. We can do a lot about reprogramming our biology in a way that creates health rather than disease. And that we typically, what we see around us is abnormal aging because people get sick and decrepit and frail and disabled and diseased. And that's just not inevitable. We can actually have a long, healthy life and have our health span equal our lifespan and be vital until the end. Right. Not like most people in America, which spend the last twenty percent of their lives sick and and in in bad shape and not able to be fully engaged in their lives, and and so functional medicine, my framework of thinking and things and systems, and is is what's well, not my functional sense, my, my my framework, but my my approach is generally think about things and systems, and functional medicine is a systems approach to thinking about health and disease and using that roadmap, and overlaying that on the science of longevity. I was able to sort of come up with a plan for and a map for how people can understand what goes on in their body over time, how they get sick and they age fast, and how to stop that process and reverse it so we can actually have more engaged, alive, um, happy citizens that will make a better society. Sure, absolutely. And I want to talk about that map, but you said we need a healthcare system, or you said something similar to this that create health, creates health rather than disease. And from my understanding right now, and after experiencing, you know, I, I think I told you about my mom being, you know, getting ill last year, experiencing that sort of thing, our medical system is not set up to create health, it's set up to treat disease. And yeah. I'm wondering if you can just talk a little bit about that before we go into the book. Totally. I think, you know, um, the, the book, in fact, is about reframing what we think of as, you know, normal, the getting older and getting sick uh, with all these disabled problems as abnormal aging. Mm -hmm. And that, and that we kind of need to reframe it to understand that, that we can have a different process of getting older and we don't have to think about disease in the same way we did. We need to think about the root causes of why we get sick. We need to think about the underlying mechanisms. And that's what the science of longevity teaches us. So we have to kind of reframe our whole healthcare system from one focused on disease to one focused on creating health yeah. rather than just treating symptoms and diseases. We need to understand how to activate our body's own innate healing system. And this is what was just so exciting for me as I unpacked a lot of the research. I've seen it a lot in my practice. You know, I've reversed people's diseases for decades, yeah. but to actually see now uh, really hardcore science map out 
these fundamental mechanisms that go wrong as we get older that underlie all disease that mirror the functional medicine model is so exciting to me because I go, oh, okay, finally the world's getting it. Finally, the world is figuring out that we need to not focus on treating disease anymore. We need to focus on creating health. And when we do that, the disease goes away as a side effect. That's great. That's great. Can you talk to me a little bit about the research? Because I think a lot of people think that the research on longevity was there, but you said, and we've only started really over the last decade, mm, decade mm, and a half, yeah. looking into this. And it's because of people like you that there's more research, I think now. Mm, but why yeah. wasn't it there? Is because we just thought everyone would die at 65? What did we think? Well, not, not die at 65, but I think we, we basically and didn't think it was a treatable problem. And now scientists mm -hmm. are reframing aging as we see it today in our society as a disease, the abnormal part of aging. I mean, yes, we're all going to get chronologically older, but biologically we can slow that process and we can prevent most of the diseases we see. So that that's why there's such an interest now in setting. And what, what happened is the government is not doing this. Yeah. The government, you know, spends like a fraction of a fraction of a percent. I mean, the National Institute on Aging basically spends like, I think 10% uh, of its budget of two some billion dollars, a couple hundred million dollars on actual studying aging itself. Whereas, whereas they spend like $6 billion on studying cancer. So yeah. cancer is just downstream from aging. If you're, for example, if you're a smoker at 35 years old and smoke two packs a day of cigarettes, your risk of cancer is far lower than that who's someone who's 70 who doesn't smoke at all. So being being older is the biggest risk factor for all these diseases. And the question is why? And it's because of these malfunctions that happen that we can treat and reverse. And that's what we call the hallmarks of aging. So now there's billions of dollars flowing in from philanthropists and billionaires who don't want to die. Right. So, right. so that, you know, whether that's their self-interest or not, whatever, they're throwing a lot of money at longevity research. And that's exciting because then we're able to start to do the work to unpack these mechanisms and figure out what works and what doesn't work. That's great. So these hallmarks of aging, can you describe them? Yeah. So we there's basically 10 things that have been described and they may fluctuate to be more or less, but there are 10 processes that, that are go awry that um, are actually not inevitable. Um, okay. they, they do happen over time if we don't do anything like if, like anything. If, if you you know if you build a brand new house and you know you move in, it's fine. you don't need to do much maintenance. But if it's a hundred year old house, I live in a 120 year old barn, I gotta you know change the yeah. roof and I gotta you know make sure that I got change the drain pipe sometimes and put a new water right. heater in and it's just like what you got to do. So the, the, the problem is we, we actually have to uh, do the things to actually put energy back into the system right. so that it actually can function at a high level. So that like, you know, houses can be a thousand years old. I was in a thousand year old castle in Tuscany, you know, sure. so, but, but, but it needs a lot of work. So I think humans are the same way. We, we get entropy and we have to put more money, more money, not money, but more energy into the system as we get older. And, and so the hallmarks of aging are the things that we can focus on. And the most important one is, is new, the one right, relates to nutrition and food, because food is the biggest modifier of our biology. And it turns out there's these four longevity pathways or switches in our cells that detect uh, our nutritional status, whether we have too much food or not enough food, too much sugar, or too much protein, not enough protein, not enough sugar. And, and so they are really important in regulating so much of what goes on and all the other hallmarks that drive sure. inflammation or mitochondrial damage or changes to our epigenome or, or changes to proteins that damage proteins or um, problems with shortened telomeres or zombie cells. All, all these things result from often poor nutrition. It's one yeah. of the factors. So, so the key is to understand that we can regulate these by cutting out starch and sugar, cutting out processed food, I mean, or really dramatically lowering starch and sugar, and then adding in phytochemicals from plant foods, adding in good fats, adding in the right kinds of protein to activate muscle synthesis, and doing it in the right timing so we can give our bodies a rest from food and, and mimic starvation, which helps us actually create a good stress in our body that activates healing systems. Mm. And then we need to add in the protein at the right time to turn that you know starvation system off and build muscle. So you need to kind of like Goldilocks, the Goldilocks proposition. 
So, you know, I think there's uh, folks that you, what you just said about sort of, you know, giving your body time to rest, you know, from, from eating, uh, there's been some controversy, I guess, around intermittent fasting. I wonder if you want to address that really quick, because I think people get confused or have questions about it. Yeah. So first of all, even the name is confusing. So, so basically in the, in the book, I describe this, there, there, there are um, many ways and many roads to Rome. The, the key is we need periods where we mimic starvation so that our body thinks, oh, uh, no food, time to clean up, time to repair, mm -hmm. time to recycle proteins, time to put in, activate my healing system to reduce inflammation. I, mean, I don't know how long this is going to last. So the body has this incredible system that kicks into gear yep. when we don't eat. <laughs> um, the problem is we just eat all the time. We yeah. eat up until bedtime, we eat when we wake up. And so we never end up in this period of rest. And and it can be 12 hour overnight fast. It can be 14 hour, 16 hour. That's called time restricted eating. That's what most people mean when they say intermittent fasting. Uh, intermittent fasting would be like a 24 hour fast once a week, a 36 gotcha. hour fast, or a fast three days, you know, maybe every quarter of water fast or seven day fast. Though that's more intermittent fasting. But you can also do it through a ketogenic diet. You can also do it through a, uh, what we call fasting mimicking diet that my friend Walter Longo has pioneered, which is essentially, you know, giving you 800 calories a day for five days as a way to sort of mimic starvation. Um, so, so calorie restriction, ketogenic diets, time restricted eating, intermittent fasting, fasting mimicking diets, they all work in the same way by activating these ancient systems in our body. Yeah. Cause we, we have so many genes that are adapted to starvation and to turn on all the right things. We almost have no genes that help us deal with excess or abundance, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. The average American is eating 500 calories more a day than they were 50 years ago, Yeah, right? That's not good for us. So, yeah. you know, having these periods of, of mimicking starvation is great because it, what does it do? It basically, in, it starts autophagy, which is a self-cleaning, recycling process, self-cannibalism. It starts a process of, of recycling and rebuilding mitochondria. It reduces inflammation. It activates your antioxidant systems. It activates your stem cells. It helps you build muscle I mean, in terms of preserving muscle and helps strengthen your, um, your, your, your mind and cognitive mm -hmm. functions. So you can find animals that mm -hmm. uh, actually helps you lose body fat and increase, increase muscle mass. So it's really an interesting phenomenon that yeah. we can activate. So interesting. One thing that, that resonated for me, um, in, in, in your book is that you say that your body is your smartest doctor. Yeah. And so I love that phrase, but like, we're not following that. And so I'm wondering how you get your, your patients and all of us on this call to sort of listen to our bodies. Does that make sense? Totally. I mean, you know, I, I've been this a long time, Danny, and what's shocking to me, and I take care of, you know, very well-educated people most of the time, people have the ability to, you know, interest in their health and want to write things. And it's just shocking to me how many people um, don't understand the connection between how they're living their lifestyle, particularly their eat what they're eating and how they feel. Like yeah. they don't get it, yeah. and 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 those they, they don't connect the dots. So I think it's so important for people to listen to their bodies and what works. I can tell you what to do, but if it doesn't work for you, it doesn't mean it's right for you because right. we're all different. So I always say, you know, you can try different things, but like for example, if you have, if you have a belief that eating meat is bad. And you become a vegan, but all of a sudden you become infertile and you lose muscle and you have low libido and your hair is falling out. And, you know, that might not be the right thing for you. Sure, <laughs> sure. But I mean, if you're vegan and you're like running, running marathons and you feel good and you've learned how to do it, that's fine. So it, it's like the, the, it's the obsession with a certain ideology that gets in people's way mm -hmm. of what to do that's right for them. Yeah, no, I think that's so important. That's like, you know, I, I've, I'm obviously not a doctor and, and, but I, I know a lot about nutrition and I, you know, when people ask me like what I eat, I was like, it doesn't matter what I eat. It matters like how you feel, you know, and how you, you decide, you know, what your body needs because everyone's different. And, right. and so I think that that's really important. That's right. One of the things that I, I also wanted to, to talk about is how can we encourage folks to eat according to what, again, what they feel they, they, know their body needs, not just on an individual level, but sort of on this, you know, structural or systemic level, like to think about sort of how to eat for the greater good. Mm, that's a great question. I mean, we, yeah, we're, we're, you know, every time we eat, 
it's a personal act of health or not. It's a agricultural act. Uh, it's Wendell a political, <laughs> right? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yes, he was one of my heroes. Uh, it's a political act. Uh, it's an environmental act. Uh, it's a climate action. So literally every time you put something on your fork, it matters in so many ways. It's a social action. So, you know, I think we have to be very conscious, but not be crazy about it. But we have to be very conscious about how we can think about our food through the greater web of everything we're connected to. It connects us to the earth, to each other. And, and so the choice we make matter. It matters to our own health, it matters to climate, it matters to biodiversity, it matters yeah. to farm workers and you know how they're treated. I mean, it's really quite important to think about it more holistically. And so there's a there's actually a great uh, model out of California they used for purchasing um, food through um, a program they call Good Food Purchasing Program, I think. Mm -hmm. yes. And it's, it's essentially it's it's you know the state saying okay. We're going to make a, a set of guidelines that we can use as a filter for determining how to buy food that we're going to serve in institutions and universities and prisons and wherever. You know, and it, is it you know is it nutritious? Is it humanely uh, raised for the animals? Are the farm workers treated nicely? Is there right. a positive environmental impact? You know, so they they go through the social, you know, the human, the environmental, the animal sort of impacts, and and have a filter. And I think that's. That's helpful to think about. Now, you, obviously, you can't control that. You go out to restaurants, you know what you're eating. It's like, sure. all right, like, okay, I had like some, I'm in the hotel here in New York and I had right. some, you know, salmon and I, I don't know where it came from exactly. And, you know, sure. you know it's like maybe it was a healthy place, maybe it was farming. It wasn't. So it's like, you do your best, but um, at least I'm eating something that I know is a real food. I can recognize it and it might not have everything I want or it might have things that I don't want in it, but, you know, you do the best you can. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, you mentioned, you know, veganism earlier, and I think your last book was uh, the the vegan diet, um, and and the benefits of of you know eating more plant forward or plant based, um, and you you know this relates to what we were just talking about, sort of eating for the greater good. The you know you say that this kind of diet, the vegan diet, which you can describe again to folks in a minute, is designed to regenerate human and planetary health, which are just so inseparable. So I guess one, explain to folks who might not know what the vegan diet is, and then why, why again they're so connected. Why the environment and the vegan diet are so connected? Well, well, like I said, you know, you know, when we eat, it's a much bigger, we're more, much bigger web. Um, that we're involved in, and, and it, it affects so much of what we're doing. And so, um, I think I think when we look at um, the choice we're making about food, although we can't always really be perfect, we should try to lean towards purchasing food and as best we can afford it that is not harming us, not harming animals, and not harming right. the planet. <laughs> it's just kind of like a basic framework. And then we should think about food as medicine. Food is how is food medicine for us? And how is food medicine for the planet? So there's ways of growing food that actually are healing for the planet, right? If you use regenerative practice in agriculture, you're going to be restoring the soil. You're going to be improving biodiversity and helping protect our water uh, tables and our water systems. And you're helping to you know, reduce reduce damage to um, the environment from all that. And mm -hmm. if you have regeneratively raised animals, you're also benefiting them and the environment in, in many ways and yourself. So it's just a filter that we use as part of the thinking about how do we optimize our diet. Great, great. Um, and uh, we had a really great podcast about the vegan diet, I guess, Elena can remind me maybe in 2021. But if, if folks want to go back and listen to that, I, I do want to shift gears a little bit, Mark, and talk about you know, when I think about what you're saying, it makes so much sense to me because I can go to the farmer's market or the grocery store and buy whatever I want, whether it's good or bad, but I have, yeah. you know, this, this luxury and yeah. as do you, and as do many people who are watching uh, and listening. Um, and so when I think about the impacts, like, you know, reading your book, the impacts that stress and trauma have on our lives as we age, as we get older, that's different for different groups of people. And so, you know, thinking about, you know, food as medicine, as this lens that we're looking through, you know, what are your, what, what, what's your advice for these, you know, folks who don't have the, the same luxury privilege um, that we do? 
You know, I, I think I, I thought about this a lot and I've written about this a lot. And I think, you know, one of the one of the arguments around this approach to thinking about food is that it's elitist, that it's discriminatory. Um, and I think I think, you know, it can be. But but if you look at the data, just again, looking at the data, uh, you know, and, and there have been a lot of a lot of studies that have evaluated this, looking at the price of eating real food. That's 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 good for you versus you know junk food and ultra processed food. Right. It's either there's either no difference or it's maybe an extra fifty cents a day and you no know, another fifty cents a day and fifteen dollars a month that can be you know significant for some people but it's it's doable for most people. It's really about the not knowing how. I mean I I um, was in a movie called Fed Up and we went into South Carolina in one of the worst food deserts in America. And it was a family of five living on food stamps and disability. They uh, had a thousand dollars a month for food for the five of them. They eat all processed food, all junk food. They were really struggling to keep healthy. And uh, the father was 42 already on dialysis from food induced diabetes. The mother was a few hundred pounds plus overweight. The son was 16 and almost diabetic. 50% body fat and almost 10 for a guy. And um, I was like, uh, why do you guys want to lose weight? And they're like, well, you know, we're, my dad can't get a new kidney until he loses 50 pounds. Yeah, I remember the story. Yeah. yeah and so, um, you know, I thought, okay, well, I, you know, I don't really know what it's like to live like that. I mean, I was you know, when I was little, we lived in New York in a one bedroom apartment. And my mom slept on the couch. My sister and I shared a bedroom. We, you know, sure. ate chicken livers and rice for dinner and onions, you know. So I kind of have some sense of how hard it can be, but I was a little yeah. kid, so I didn't really. Um, but it, they, 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 they did not know what to do. They just didn't have the education and they thought they were doing the right thing. And they were listening to the marketing messages of the food companies, low fat this and light that and Cool Whip uh -huh. has got no trans fats, even though it's all trans fat. It's all, it was all horrible. And so I just showed them what they were eating. No, no judgment. I educated them about what was in the food and what it did to them. And they were shocked. And then I and then I said, well, let's let's kind of cook a meal together. And so we cooked a meal with simple ingredients. You know, we made turkey chili, some roasted sweet potatoes, some stir-fried asparagus, a simple salad with all one vinegar dressing and carrots and cucumbers and stuff that wasn't really expensive. It's from good good food on a tight budget, which is an environmental working group guide on how to eat well for you right. and the planet and your wallet. And I, I said, okay, well, they love the food. It was amazing. And then I said, why don't you try this? Like, here's this guide and here's, you know, here's my cookbook and like, try it. <laughs> like, I hope it works. And I got them a cutting board and knives because they didn't even have that. And they didn't, because they never cooked anything and they never cooked in their house. They just reheated things or put things in a microwave. And, and they, they lost in the first week, 18 pounds, the first year, 200 pounds, the son lost a ton of weight. Uh, the mother, the father was able to lose 50 pounds and get a new kidney. The mother lost over a hundred pounds. The son ended up gaining back 50, but then he, he was working in Bojangles, which is where the kids work down there in those fast food restaurants. Sure. Sure. But then he eventually got, he got it together and asked for my help. He lost 134 pounds and uh, ended up ended up going to medical school. He was, then when his family ever went to college okay. and he ended up going to medical school. So I think, um, you know, it's possible uh, and it doesn't have to be elitist and it can be done. And you don't may not mean you're eating a $70 grass fed ribeye steak, but you're right. having cheaper cuts of meat. You're having vegetables. I mean, you know, like, uh, I mean, for example, like when I was young, my mom used to make cabbage soup with cabbage and carrots and onions and like cheap cuts of meat that she put in like boiled meat and which ended up being tender when you boil it for three hours. You know, it's like, right. And it was delicious. I thought it was great. You know, yeah. I didn't think it was a, a peasant food, but that was like, right. you know, peasant food. <laughs> so um, <laughs> what they used to eat in Russia, right? So I think there's sure. there's a lot of dishes like that, that people can learn, you know, four or five dishes. They Absolutely. can learn three or four breakfasts, three or four lunches, and just, you don't have to like be a master chef, but it's just basic skill set that you have to learn. Yeah. No, and I, I, I do want to go back to this idea of, of, you know, how we can sort of, counteract that stress and the trauma that we, you know, just, you know, whether we're in, you know, living in Kentucky or living in New York City, how, you know, diet can counteract that stress that it can make us, you know, sort of, you know, you, you helped that family and you've helped many people reverse the health impacts of, 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 you know, uh, some of their, 
their, you know, dietary related problems, but, you know, it's hard to handle stress. Not everyone, you know, can, can afford therapy. It's great no. when you can, but like food can help you counteract the, what's happening in your life. From what I understand well, from your book, if I'm reading it correctly. Yeah. yeah. I mean, first of all, you know, certain things are powerful tools for stress reduction. I talked about in the book that are not expensive or that yeah. are free, like your breath, <laughs> right. like meditation, <laughs> like stretching, like taking a hot bath. Like, I mean, there's things that really are either no cost or almost no cost that are available to us to learn how to activate our healing and relaxation systems. Sure. But I think what you're pointing to, Danny, is that, and this is something I, I think is shocking to most people, that actually different foods can be stressful for your body and other foods can be healing. And I don't mean just stressful in the sense of like, you know, making you gain weight. I mean, literally activating cortisol and adrenaline in your body to activate the stress hormones. So when you eat sugar and starch, you actually activate adrenaline, you activate cortisol, which makes you feel more stressed. And that's why you see kids who you know go to a birthday party and are bouncing off the walls because they're eating cake and ice cream and sure. going crazy. That's because their bodies get all amped up from all the stress hormones. Yeah. And that's totally uh, treatable. And you know, I think for our mental health, it's really important to learn how to eat to keep our mood better. Uh, there's a whole now Department of Nutritional Psychiatry at, at Harvard um, and Metabolic Psychiatry at Stanford. I wrote a book, you know, 15 years ago called, almost 15 years ago, called The Ultra Mind Solution. Right. It's about how we fix our brain. It's so dysfunctional from what we're doing. So, um, yeah, food is a huge, huge factor. That's, that's great. I, I wonder, um, you know, before we turn to Q&A, you know, from from doing the research for this book and, you know, just your whole life has been dedicated to these issues. What do you think is the most exciting, you know, innovative therapy that's out there to help, you know, you know, to to stop or reverse aging, but to just create better health to, to you know, to to reverse some of the, the the issues that we've been talking about this whole podcast? You mean you mean things that are coming on the horizon that I think are kind of the new and fun yeah. and funky things? What's or you think, exciting are you to you? I mean, the basics are really exciting because when you dial in like personalized approaches that are designed for longevity science to optimize diet, exercise, stress reduction, sleep optimization, hormone optimization, nutritional status, that'll get you most of the way there. But then there's some really cool stuff coming down the pike, like hyperbaric oxygen therapy, ozone, exosomes. And, and even this thing uh, that you might not have heard about called plasmapheresis. I really love this because it's sort of it makes so much sense. And actually right. there's some interesting experiments where they took mice and they would wire up their circulation of an old mouse to a young mouse. And then the old mouse would become young. And they didn't know if it was from factors from the young mouse or if it was stuff they took out of the old mouse. And what they did was they kind of kind of followed up on that experiment and they found they just filtered the blood of the old mouse. They didn't hook it up to a young mouse. They just put it through this filter process we call plasma phoresis. Plasma is the soup that you're cells float around in and then they clean the blood they threw uh -huh. that old plasma out and they either reconstitute it with albumin or they basically just let your body reconstitute depending on how much taken out and they found that the mice actually had all the same benefits of becoming younger when they did that and this is something you could do like once a quarter it's a simple relatively simple procedure you go to the doctor and it could it could make a profound difference and it's used now to treat all sorts of problems all, all kinds of autoimmune diseases and and inflammatory problems yeah. mm -hmm. that's really exciting um so i i would just want to show the book again and encourage everyone mm -hmm. who doesn't have a copy uh to to purchase it young forever the secrets to living your longest healthiest life such a valuable resource thank you dr mm -hmm. hyman so much oh, for putting pleasure. it together my pleasure. My pleasure. um if if it's okay for with you i'd like some of these food tank members um they've been very active in the chat but I'm, I'm going to turn to um, Ian Smith first to, to ask the first question, if that's okay. Of course, of course, yeah. Elena's getting him off mute. Thanks, Elena. Hi, Danny. Hi, Mark. Thank you Hi. for being here. So I'm a student of international studies and I didn't get a chance to read your book. But well, it just I came was, out I, <laughs> yesterday. <laughs> <that's true. laughs> 
So I don't know if you talked about international issues in it, but I was wondering if there are countries anywhere in the world that take functional medicine seriously. You know, there are countries that who have healthcare systems that treat health rather than disease, as you mm. so eloquently put, you know, that the U.S. can take inspiration from. Yeah, I mean, you know, I think there's... Um... There's a bunch of, of countries that I think are exploring this in a different way. Um, but I think, you know, America is probably still the most uh, focused on functional medicine. In Europe, they have biological medicine, which is very similar. And for example, in um, in Germany and Switzerland, um, they do a lot of this. Uh, I think, uh, I wish there was more of it around the world, but there isn't. <laughs> No, thanks for that, Mark. And thanks, Ian, for asking that question. Ursula has a really interesting question um, and comment, but specifically she's asking about, you know, how we can sort of change USDA practices, that's the US Department of Agriculture, and what you're thinking about as the farm bill comes up this year. And, and so many of the folks on this call are, are working on it. Yeah, for sure. You know, it's exciting. I mean, I have a nonprofit. Uh, it's called the Food Fix Campaign. And, you know, we raised a fair bit of money to actually help influence policy. We met with over 75 lawmakers, Republicans and Democrats, both sides of the aisle, White House, USDA, HHS. And we're really working diligently. We're really helpful in moving forward some of the provisions in the IRA bill for $20 billion for improving agriculture. And some of it was for regenerative ag. Um, we're working right now um, with Vern Buchanan, who's the uh, chair of the health subcommittee on the ways mm -hmm. and means committee which is mm -hmm. in charge of a trillion dollars for medicare and he's super excited about uh moving forward on this conversation and That's we're having right. hearing hearings coming up and how we can affect the farm bill and some of the food policies in the farm bill because i mean the farm bill really barely should be called called the food bill because it's it's 75 percent of it is food programs right. <laughs> farm programs um and so I think it's kind of a, an exciting moment. It, you know, it's it's going to be a tough slog, but I think I think there's a, a increasing amount of awareness and interest in this. There's a lot of people working on this, including you and the Environmental Working Group and folks from Tufts and Daria Mazafara and our group and sure. Kiss the Ground. And so there's a lot of a lot of voices all singing the same chorus about how we need to reimagine the, our food system and farm bill. But I, you know, I just saw, for example, USA Today and I think the Wall Street Journal just had articles on how we can you know, do medically tailored meals for people. And yep. I mean, that's really great to see that in mainstream media and um, and actually how we can start to sort of shift the policy around. And I just sent, I sent that to him and I said, we can do this, you know? So that's the goal. Yeah, it's really an exciting time. A lot of these things that a lot of people have been working on for decades are finally coming to sort of fruition in, in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. So this next farm bill is probably the most important important farm bill that uh, I think, you know, a, a lot of people can remember. Um, Dr. William Burke uh, from the Mapata Institute has a question. Hmm. Hi. Uh, yes. Hi, Danny. Hi, Mark. Uh, it's a Mapata is my background. I'm also at uh, Michigan State University. Thanks for being here. Um, my question, and I'm going to do my best not to make it sound uh, silly, but a lot of kind of the implicit assumption that we're, we have is that people care about not getting uh, aging and living longer. And I think that you could tell me, but there's probably a, a strong positive correlation between actual aging and how much you care about it. Uh, you kind of joked about that earlier when you were saying, you know, these billionaire philanthropists want to live forever, but the people who I think can influence longevity the most are probably the young people so how do you propose or am i am i off base first of all and if i'm not how do you think we can reconcile that and get young people thinking more about how their choices now are influencing how they're going to live 50 years from now well i, I think that's a hard sell to be honest with you i think what, what really gets people is how do you feel better now how do you do i mean because you know whether you're 20 or 30 or 40 the amount of chronic illness is just rampant. Like I said, 93% of Americans, that's adults, children, thin people, people overweight, are metabolically unhealthy. Okay, that that means most Americans don't feel good. Yeah. <laughs> and so everybody's interested in feeling better and optimizing their health. And the consequence of doing that is that you optimize for longevity as well. And so I think I think you don't have to sell people on the then, it's on the now. And mm. the now, the payoff is is tremendous in terms of 
your well-being, your cognitive function, your mood, your energy, your capacity to do whatever you want to do in life. Well, that's really the key. The whole point of this game is to is to be able to show up every day and do what you want <laughs> and and give the country be the contribution that you want in your life. Thanks, Mark. Kristen Olson, you have a question. Yeah, hi. Um, I was interested in what you were saying about intermittent fasting because I see all sorts of young parents, you know, with kids that are nine, 10, five, six giving them snacks all day long because they believe that, you know, if their hunger level rises and their blood sugar drops, they're just going to, their behavior is going to be off, that they're going to be hangry. What do you think about that? Well, they will be actually if they feed them sugar and starch because their blood sugar is going to be going up and down like a yo-yo. Uh, the key is to give kids protein and fat and keep their blood sugar even and they won't have that problem. And you don't need to eat all the time. In fact, it's terrible to eat all the time. Thanks, Mark. Ursula, did you have another question? I do. Hi, Mark. I met you many Hi. years ago at the University at Buffalo when you received an award the same night as my husband. And so it's lovely oh, to see wow. you again. Oh, great to see you too. It was a long time ago. But my question is around food resilience. So I work a lot in local food systems and revitalizing local food systems as they're related to so many of the factors you already talked about. And one mm -hmm. of the things we run into all the time is about, uh, you know, the food, the issues of food justice. And you talked about um, affordable food and, you know, mm -hmm. you referenced that uh, great document from EWG. But I, I, I wonder in terms of the, the work that you've done, I've read so many of your books, I'm having trouble focusing and trying to figure out how we focus on lower income and, and BIPOC communities um, mm -hmm. around these issues of good, healthy, localized food. Because I, I really believe that a uh, good, healthy, local, local food is our resilient food structure of the future. Yeah, I agree. I mean, uh, one of the things we did was uh, with the Food Fix Campaign, work with Rodale Institute, and we brought David Scott over, who was the chairman of the Ag Committee to Rodale, and we got him to understand what was going on. And he ended up getting $300 million to, to BIPOC farmers in Pennsylvania to actually do a lot of this kind of uh, work. So I think this is starting to happen. Um, I think it's, you know, it's a, it's like, you know, the abolitionists when they started, you know, they were, they were doing this in the 1700s and it took like 150 years <laughs> to get rid of slavery. And we're still yeah. dealing with 150 years later, uh, the consequences of that. So it, it's, it's incremental, but I think, I think the, there is, there is a lot of provisions, for example, in the, the, the new IRA provisions that we advocated for, for, for more of, um, addressing some of the you know, uh, underserved communities for BIPOC farmers. And so there, there's, def it's definitely happening. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Mark. I thought I saw someone else's hand up, but they've taken it down maybe. Anyone want to raise their hand? There mm -hmm. you go. Dina, Dina, I don't know if I'm pronouncing it correctly. Please go ahead. One second while we get you off mute. Um, can, sorry, do you mind saying a few words? It, it does look like you are unmuted. Go, go ahead, try so that we, we can't hear you. Do you want to write it in the chat quickly? Thanks for your patience, everyone. I know the technology is sometimes difficult. Hmm. And Mark, I really appreciate your time here. I know you've, you've oh, been sure. working thank very hard to promote this book the last day and you. a half. Thank you. Oh, great. No, it's great. Getting as much, um, uh, you know, out about it, I think is important. So, okay, sh sh uh, Dina, Dina, I'm sorry. I will, she is wondering if you heard of zero acre oil. I think that's, yes, I think that's, um, I have. Um, I haven't, Mark, so I I have no help I, here. I, I, I have. I, I, I someone showed it to me the other night, um, and I think it's what I'm thinking about. Um, 
and I think it's it's sort of oil that uh, is cultured oil that's made sort of a cooking oil that's fermented. That, She's agreeing um, with you. Yeah, that uh, you know, you know, is sort of deals with a lot of the problems that we have with our refined oils. Um, it's it's uh, you know. It's new. I don't know much about it other than, you know, I don't know what the science is about it, but someone sure. actually let me try it the other day. So yeah, it's, she mostly was just... mono, it's mostly mono, it's mostly modern fat, uh, which is, which is from um, like, like the olive oil, but it's also got a high smoke point. So you can cook in higher heat and has a lower environmental footprint. And so it's clean, doesn't have like flavors like coconut oil. So there, there, there may be some benefits. I just, I haven't seen any of the research on it. So I don't know if there is any. <laughs> Of course. Thanks for bringing that up, though, and I will check it out, too. Um, you know, I, I guess, you know, maybe uh, I'm looking for other questions here. Please put them in the chat or raise your hand. But Mark, you know, in terms of, you know, we, we've talked a lot about advice here. Um, you know, we talked about how parents are sort of struggling and they're given a lot of information. There, and, and you and I have talked about this before, you know, every day there's a new nutrition or health headline you know whether it's on on the 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 news or youtube or you know whatever you're reading and that's so confusing to people and i'm wondering how we break down this confusion uh well it's hard uh it's why i wrote food what the heck should i eat right. <laughs> as people were so confused about it i also detail a lot about this in my book um so it's it's uh it's kind of uh also that and i think it's really about um kind of getting out of the noise, doing a little bit of learning and homework sure. figuring out, and then tr trying what works for you best and seeing what makes most sense. Absolutely. And, and often, you know, people like you and others, it comes down to very simple advice. You know, uh, you know, Michael Pollan said it, I, you know, really well, you know, eat more plants, eat, you know, eat what your grandmother would eat. You know, he has that whole line. Right. <laughs> it, it's, it's often very simple. Yeah, food, rules, food, food rules is great. If it turns your milk, yeah. turns your milk color, maybe don't eat it. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. If your grandmother wouldn't recognize it as food. Yeah. Right. Exactly. And so, and you're, you're kind of, you know, this is not, you're, I know you're like such a scientist and such an expert on these issues, but this is not rocket science either. It's this not, is just no, eating no, really, no. you know, trying to eat better, eating well, taking care mm -hmm. of yourself and all mm -hmm. the, you know, in mm -hmm. easy ways, you know, I especially liked what you said about, you know, reducing stress. People can do that on their own. People can, you know, do all of these like self-care things that we just, you don't learn them in school, I think is the thing. And so your, your ability to educate and spread that awareness I think is very exactly. powerful. Exactly. That's the whole game. It's just people need to understand how their bodies work and to work with them rather than against them. And that's really the whole kind of purpose of my work is to get people empowered with the information they need to do what's required to get healthy. Absolutely. I think that that's a great point to end on. I really, really appreciate you doing this. I, I know you're traveling like crazy. Yeah, it's always fun to talk to you. I always learn a lot and I'm always reminded of things that I, I should know. Um, so I, I really appreciate that. Oh, um, I, so I want to remind everyone to pick up a copy of, of Young Forever. Great book. Um, and be sure to tune into Mark's podcast, The Doctor's Pharmacy. Be sure to tune into uh, our podcast, Food Talk with Danny Nirenberg. Our next episode is coming out tomorrow with Mark, and we will share part of today's conversation as well as my own reflections along with um, uh, Rob Para, our executive producer, about what Mark talked about. And please stay tuned for details about our next Food Tank members meeting with Leah Penniman, who I adore. Oh, she's amazing. Ugh. And so, and I hope you will all stay in touch with me at Danny near, um, sorry, at Danielle at foodtank.com, but really, really appreciate you, Mark. And, and please take care and be well. Thank you so much, Danny. Thanks everybody for having me. And thanks for all the work you all do to make the world a better place. Oh, you're sweet. Thank you. Bye everyone.